What's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of the Dreams Reality Podcast and today we've got a very, very special guest, Jade Everington. How are you doing? Good, thanks. You nervous? No, I'm all right. We're ready. So as you can see guys already, we're in a complete different environment. We're not at a studio back in my office. We are actually at a school in Peterborough and we're going to dive into your story very, very soon. But currently, just so you can hear the kind of the backstory, at the moment, you are a teacher, a geography teacher, is that correct? Yep, yep, this and is my what, classroom. And what do people know you for? Um, so some people might know me for being an alpine ski racer. Okay. Um, and that's what I competed in in the 2014 Winter Paralympics. Wow. So to now be teaching is a very different lifestyle. Amazing. So there's going to be me- there literally a lot of questions I have for you, um, mainly around what you do the challenges you have been through, how you overcome them, just mindset and type of motivation stuff. And for you, especially now, to be a coach and kind of teaching the kids, it is incredible. Um, But where did it all start for you? So I'm going to ask you some questions. It might be some silly questions, but I just want everyone to kind of know your story and really understand what you go through on a daily basis and and where your mentality really came from. So where where did it all start for you? Um, I think really it was my family. Okay. I know that sounds cliche, but being born with a visual impairment, um, my parents were very strong in making sure I had the ability to be able to do anything that I wanted. So my mum actually had the same condition as what I had. Wow, okay. Um, and she's fully blind. She can't see anything. So to be able to grow up and watch her be able to cook and do different sports and even ski herself that really motivated me to be able to you know push boundaries even if other people didn't think I was able to do anything I knew if my mum can do it then so can I and I was lucky enough to be born with vision so I was more able Um, when I was younger to be able to kind of try out different experiences and I think having the mentality of always saying yes and trying something is kind of where it all started. So did your was your mum born with any sight? Yes my mum was born with some sight and then she lost her sight aged 14. At the age of 14 wow so um, when did you did they know as soon as you was born they realized and did you from even a toddler's age did you get the support you needed was it difficult or do you just not really know much different how, how was it um so as soon as, as soon as i was born i think cause i had re- i had really big eyes it was quite obvious i had the same condition so okay. i have glaucoma and axenfeld syndrome okay so glaucoma is usually um, occurs in older adults over the age of 60, 65. So wow. it's quite rare to have um, a baby, especially, yeah, yeah, with glaucoma. And then because I have an Axenfeld syndrome, it means my condition is a little bit more rarer. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it acts in a different way. There's not that much research into it. So as soon as wow. I was born, um, I've been part of uh, the Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. Um, I had my first operation was when I was 10 days old. Wow. So really since then, under Morfield's care, I have had you know, many operations to try and save my sight as much as possible. I think picking up an eye condition as early as possible obviously gives you the best chance to keep as much vision. Yeah. And even though I only have about 5% vision left now. Only 5% now? Yeah. Wow. I'm very grateful and I value that 5%. Okay, um, so has it always been 5% or did you... Or, um, yeah. No, so... Or does it go up and down? How, how is it? It has got worse as I've got older. Um, during my school years, it wasn't too bad. I um, just couldn't see really small print or things really far away. Um, but then when I hit 17, my eyesight started to deteriorate every day wow i mean i remember going to the hospital and um going on the monday and you know re- having the vision check and on the snellen chart being able to read a couple of quite a few mm. lines down and then going back 
the next Monday and I'd lost five lines of vision. Wow. So every morning that I woke up, it, it got worse. And that was pretty hard to deal with, especially doing mm. A-levels at the same time. Um, it meant, you know, it was very difficult for me to sleep to be able to wake up and have those changes so suddenly. It was quite a lot to deal with um, under a short space of time. Yeah, so like before, I wanna talk a little bit about when you were 17 and after that, but going through primary school, secondary school, how was that for you? How was it being in school and having say an eye condition? Um, Was it difficult? Did people understand? at the moment, obviously, I didn't know when you what you was like when you was in school, but yeah. now you seem very positive. Yeah. Have you always been positive? Um, I think. Which is it just like anything? Let's be honest. It goes yeah. up, it goes up and down. You're not. It's you get used to it. So I've always known that I've had a visual impairment, and even when it was better when I was at primary school, secondary school, I knew that I was slightly different, but I took kind of pride in that and. I always thought, even though I have something else to deal with, I can still try and be the best that I can be. Mm. And yes, it was very difficult sometimes. Um, you know, I'd miss school back from going to hospital, having eye operations. It, it can mm. be painful, having medication and things like that. But I think having such a supportive family and having it to be such a norm for us mm really made the difference because unless you have a visual impairment or you live with someone with a visual impairment it's very very difficult to understand that it's not just vision it's everything else that comes with that it's your balance it's um you know being being able to recognize people communicate with people yeah. being able to move around you know age 17 just things you don't expect i guess yeah you, yeah Age 17, everyone else is learning to drive. I didn't have that opportunity. I have to be very dependent on other people in in that aspect. So it was about adapting to what would be the norm and then what would be the norm for me. Have you ever felt frustrated? Oh yes, every day. Every day? Every day and even still now, I feel very frustrated that I have to rely on other people sometimes. Do you think that's a big one, that you just have to rely on other people? Yeah, you have to learn to trust people pretty much as soon as you meet them. Because obviously being an athlete, doing what you're doing as well, what you've done before and what you've achieved, I guess, yeah, if you're more than capable, obviously you've got a university degree, you're an athlete, but then when you still have to depend on people, I can imagine when you're such a high achiever... You still have to be, not humble, but you have to still come back to down to now. And as you said, other people may have to support you. So does that breed a certain sense of frustration? Or does that, um, uh, how, how is that? I feel, and I'm very clear to people who I work with, whether that's teaching or in skiing, I'm always used to working with one person very closely. I have okay. to learn to trust people, be open. I think it's important to be able to talk about my vision. And so the person who I'm with, you know, even when that's like a new boyfriend, you have to be very open because it's such a personal um, thing for me that even though I could ski, it's in despite of my visual mm. impairment. So having the frustration of not being able to go to the toilet when I want or not being able to access the food or be able to go and visit somewhere mm. or even see a film at the cinema, it's m- more normally the frustration of the situation. Wow, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there's so many different dynamics, what I think, even myself, which is what I have huge respect for you to talk about it, is because people don't understand, and if somebody doesn't share Mm. that, how will they understand? Exactly, and I um, appreciate the fact that someone might not have ever come across as someone who's visually impaired and vision is such a independent thing that even though I'm visually impaired my vision is very different to my mum's or Mm. my sister's or anyone else so I'm quite photophobic someone else might not have that and therefore you have to behave differently and be able to react differently to that if you're Mm. kind of meeting or you know working with someone with that visual impairment it's an understanding which enables you to well enables me to feel more comfortable in being able to do different sports or different activities so i don't i don't want to get too far ahead but i don't want to miss this question especially as we're onto this 
How do the kids respond to you? The kids you teach? Yeah, so um, I'm very open with them. The first lesson I have. You need to be, let's be honest. I think you need to be. They always wonder, why is there another person, an adult, in the classroom? So I say to them, look, I'm Mrs. Etherington, slightly different to any other teacher, and that's because I'm visually impaired. So I can't see as well as you, but I can teach. We just might do things in a different way. I can hear you. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. We have some safety rules, and every student who comes into my classroom is able to ask me any questions about my visual impairment um, and you know they like it sometimes I use it as a teaching tool so I say I can't see this map or I can't see this graph you need to be able to describe it to me and I use it in that way and and they feel supported and then perhaps they might be a little bit more open to me because I have to kind of you know expose Mm. myself to them and a lot of the time they're very accepting and they understand and I do have some students who will push it, you know. Of course. You know, will throw stuff. Have I seen that? Mm. But I just work in a different way and I use different um, te- techniques. Yeah. So, to be so open takes a huge amount of courage. Because let's be honest, whether it's an eye condition or whether it's something else, it could be a hairline, it could yeah. be a height, it could be literally anything. I know it's not as serious, but. We all have our own insecurities. So have you ever gone through a time in your life when you've really struggled to talk about it? I know you're married now, so you also say about boyfriend in general. Um, So then with that said, was that a difficult thing to go out there or was it just all come naturally? How does that Um, work? I think it's probably quite easy in a way for me to tell people. Um, about my visual impairment if I need to. So I'm quite lucky in the fact that some people don't recognise or even realise that I have a visual impairment straight away. You know, they might not expect me to wear heels or do my hair or apply my own makeup. And so a lot of the time I have control as to whether I need to tell the person or not. However, if I'm in a situation where I have to explain why I can't, you know, read the train times or something it does make you feel vulnerable so it is a bit of a struggle sometimes to be able to explain what I can and can't see yeah. without that person incredible. you know yeah. seeing me do something so <laughs> we're in Peterborough yeah driving here <laughs> <laughs> me and the cameraman looking around going it's so flat yeah. Where did she learn to ski? I know, it's pretty well, how ironic. How did that happen? Talk, talk to us. How, um, how did you first learn to ski? How did it become somewhat of something you wanted to really pursue on a, such a high level? Mm-hmm. How did that happen? Um, it was a ski holiday. So I went away with my family and we'd ski just for a week. And I learned how to ski probably from about the age of eight. Mm. Just used to go away to France to rent to the French Alps, not in Lincolnshire. <laughs> um, and I just loved that sport. It wasn't really a sport for me, it was just no. recreational. And then um, when I was about 17, the, during the time where my eyesight was really affecting me, where I was kind of insecure about it, where I had those dark days. At 17? Yeah. Okay. Um, my dad actually took me to the Chill Factory in Manchester snow dome and there was a trial a weekend trial for the british disabled ski team i did the trial on the saturday and they asked me to come back on the sunday i had some coaching and i obviously responded well to their coaching and actually got a place on the development squad from that weekend so but you asked me when was the first time i really saw skiing as a sport well for me it was in 2012 so I'd been on the team for so how old you in 2012 um, um how old was I in 20 same, same, same age huh? in 2012 I would have been 19 no 20 21 maybe I don't know maths is not anyway. <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> um I'd been on the ski team for about two years so I think I was about 19 how was that being a part of the ski team well, the first two years were very different because 
One, I didn't have a guide, so my dad would come out and guide me. <laughs> so I learned how to stop very quickly. Okay, silly question. He would fall over. Silly question, what will the guide do? What is a guide? So I ski with a guide who skis in front of me. Okay. So I ski behind them, about one or two metres behind, um, and we have radios in our helmet so we can communicate. Okay. So the person in front of me, my guide, would tell me when to turn. But they would never say left or right, because so that's too dangerous. Okay. A lot of people, you know, you can get mixed up. So they'd say, and turn. And then I would know which direction they're going in from kind of the direction that we first started okay. the yeah. run on. Um, so the first two years, I really kind of watched the team. I went abroad and improved my fundamentals in my skiing. I learned how to ski better. I didn't race at all. I would just be part of the team, part of the mentality, part of what they were trying to achieve. Yeah. And as I said, one of the first camps I went on, my dad was my guide. Wow. And he's an all right skier. <laughs> yeah. But he's not a racer by he's any your stretch. Dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he did fall over quite a few times. So I learned how to stop very quickly because obviously, if someone <laughs> falls in front of you, you of need course. to be able to stop. And that was a good skill to learn. You know, I, I started my career as an athlete wow. from the bottom. You know, I didn't I didn't have equipment or really any idea. So those first couple of years, I learned how to ski properly and was part of a Paralympic program to visit the 2012 Olympic Games in London. And you got to think Paralympics before 2012 was unheard of I didn't really know what it entailed especially winter sports and just going out there and being part of the stadium and being part of the crowd and seeing you know Johnny Peacock win his gold mm. and the other athletes winning medals and representing Great Britain at home games it really kind of resonated with me that yeah. I had the opportunity to be able to go out and represent my country in a sport which is pretty, you know, Amazing. unique. Yeah, of course. So it was really then that kind of it switched and I thought I'm going to do this full commitment. Okay. And race. So what was the race, next race. step? Race. Went out, I think it was probably October, the beginning of the season, and I did a slalom race. And that's the... Um, Slowest race you can do. Is that time. your first ever race? Yeah, and you normally start with slalom. So you have two runs, it's very short, fast, quick turns. So you have to be a very good skier to be able to do yeah, of course. the slalom turns. And as soon as I did that first race, the adrenaline that you got I got. The bug. Yeah. Being able to, you know, move past through the gates with someone in front of you shouting at you, you know, pushing you to go faster and faster and chase them. It was just addictive. So wow. as soon as I did a slalom, I was like, I'm going to do giant slalom. I'm going to do super G. And then the downhill. Wow. The fastest, te you know. So when you... Was you doing this whilst at university as well? Because yeah. at what point did you get your degree? Um, so I actually graduated from my degree in 2012. Okay, so, so you've it done it all, of, like, yeah. all around the same time. So I was training and then I would come back and because I did a teaching degree, I would come back, I'd go on placement and teach students and then wow. I would leave, I would do my, you know, exams and revision and assignments on planes in hotels because we didn't have a camp as a team. We used to travel all around the world chasing the snow. Wow. So as soon as I started racing my calendar was full you know I was away for 48 weeks of the year wow so being being able to fully commit was something that I had to balance mm. with my education and I felt my education was very very important to me mm. and I knew I always wanted to teach so I knew that as an athlete that's that wasn't a long-term goal no and it was something that I had the opportunity to do and was a positive from you know, having my eyesight deteriorate. So it's quite interesting that you've always had that hunger to teach, to coach, 
but then I guess you also had I wouldn't say an opportunity to do what you've done but you it came about and you've was good at it your dad trained you in many ways <laughs> and then you just obviously you went to the Olympic like in 2012 seeing what it was and it just and then you had your first race and you got that bug you got that adrenaline mm. and then what was the next step from there really it when was, did you start becoming good yeah it was finding a guide that was quick enough that was a big problem um because i'd catch up with the guide and i wasn't having anyone slow me down of course so i needed to common? find common? um it can be it depends who your guide is and their okay. race and experience so after quite a few trials and different guides i ended up working with caroline powell who okay. i um, went to the games with okay. and she is an ex England England racer. Oh amazing. Um so she's a very good racer in her own right. Yeah. So being able to guide she had to learn new skills and techniques. Um but I would never catch her. You yeah. know, she would be skilled enough to be able to ski any discipline faster than me and in a way kind of coach me as well to chase her of and get fast. But that was the easy part. You know, it was finding the guide and being able to afford to travel. Um, I wasn't, you know, financially supported. I wasn't funded. Yeah, so how did all of this, so you said you had 48 weeks of the year. Yeah. Well, so, I did it on the on the, on the the cheap. Yeah, I don't know if you can say that in skiing, but my parents, you know, they, they, they didn't just provide me with the money so to go not, out. So there's not a lot of funding for it? No, I was funded for the last six months of my career before the games. That was the only time I got funded. So I remember talking any about time funding, you before that, me the exact number, but was it enough to? Was it okay? Um, the last six months before the games, the funding covered everything for me to be able to get to the games. It was the previous six years, which yeah, the last five you know, percent they want the the credit for exactly. So um, the team didn't have funding because no one had medaled. Wow. No one had podiumed, and that was very difficult because not only am I paying for myself to travel and, you know, pay for accommodation and license and equipment, and I was doing so many different disciplines, it's very expensive. It's about £1,000 a week, mm. and I had to pay for my guide as well. So you've got double wow. the costs. So I did a so lot. So why did you do it then? Because that's quite a lot to turn people off, I imagine. Mm, what um, kept that hunger inside you to continue it? Obviously, you said you got the bug when you had your first race. Yeah. Um, but still... I'm stubborn. When, <laughs> when you're in university, money is pretty low anyway. Yeah. Um, you had the opportunity, I would imagine, to go and teach straight away. But you wanted to pursue this first. Yeah. Was that a difficult decision? Or was, as no. you said, you're stubborn, you just, I'm going to do it. I was very, very determined that I could do both. I, I did it in a different way. And I think because I've had my visual impairment before and I did things in a different way before it didn't stop me I didn't see that as being different I knew I didn't have to go to every single race I knew I didn't have to have the top skis I knew I didn't have to change my speed suit every season I knew I could do it with the skis that I could afford or was passed down to me I had one cat suit <laughs> <laughs> for six years wow. which smelt you can't wash a cat suit it absolutely stunk however it enabled me to go out and race because i had a cat yeah. suit so um i fundraised you know i climbed snowden i ha went and found private sponsors it was very very wow. tough because also when you're abroad you're not at home trying to find kind of your funding for the next mm. season or the next and you're not race circuit. Either, and you're not working, you can't. Yeah. yeah. So I remember waiting at the end of the day uh, for people's ski passes if they weren't using them so I could then use them the next wow. day. I remember being in hotels knowing I can't afford to pay for this hotel unless something happened or wow. I'd sell something or, you know, I That's used amazing. to... That's amazing. And that, just that alone is same, sim similar principles to running a business and stuff mm -hmm. like that especially when you start up you're like 
the sacrifice. I don't even know how I'm going to make it to the end of the month. Exactly. I need something to come. Yeah. Something to come out of nowhere yeah. or go out and create it. Otherwise, I'm not going to be doing this next month. I didn't have a choice. I was in a different country. I needed to race. I needed to qualify. Qualify. I knew I was good enough. I just didn't have the tools and resources to enable me to, you know, be the best that I could mm. be. So I did everything I could possibly do. And I would you know miss going on camp so in the summer obviously the snow you need to go to the southern mm. hemisphere so people will travel to new zealand and race in new zealand i couldn't do that one year because no. i couldn't afford it so i traveled up to scotland <laughs> and went to the brayhead snow dome every weekend and i would travel there and start racing at uh Wow. about five o'clock in the morning six o'clock in the morning and even if I could get two hours on the snow that was better than nothing wow you know everything was the commitment um and you had to sacrifice time being with your family not doing it properly and people you know kind of didn't agree with how I was doing it okay in in a way you know Those you people should you be mean or just People in the um, sport, people in different A mixture. Sports. So some people didn't agree that um, I should be fulfilling that kind of athlete side and, and going to ski as well as doing my degree. Okay. And people didn't think I could do it at all. There'd be people on the team that perhaps would question why am I not at this race and okay. things like that. But, you know, but you I made proved it them work. wrong. Yeah. So then let's talk about your medals. Mm-hmm. So you said 2014 games? Yes, so in Sochi in Russia. Okay. Um, so I went out on the first day. I... How was you feeling building up to this? You're in such a bubble. Was you in a bubble. good place? Do you think you, you felt good? You felt optimistic? Was you, a, was you a big contender at this time or was you no. an underdog? No, no, no. I was very much the underdog. Okay. There were a few athletes on the team. Our team wasn't very big at all, maybe like 12 people, 12 yeah. athletes. There had been a quarter of that had been to a games beforehand. Um, you I was very unknown. I was very much the underdog. I knew I wanted to go out and represent Great Britain. All I could do was try my best. And that first race was like any other race that I'd done, really. You don't, you know, it's really quite difficult to explain because not only is it a sport way, it's completely different to being in the UK. You're in a completely different environment, yeah. different landscape. You're in a bubble. You have to learn to be selfish as an athlete. It's all about you. It's all about your performance. Mm. And obviously I was working with Caroline. It was our performance. That's what counted. Nothing else counted. For that minute and 10 seconds on the downhill, that's all that counted. And that was pressure. But I always felt if you have an expectation, you must have done something beforehand to give people that expectation. Okay. True. So I went into this thinking, I'm just going to represent Great Britain, do what I can and value the time that I had there. And I raced and I really wanted to perform and ski well, show people how I could ski. And going through that downhill race, was the scariest thing ever. <laughs> One, because you're traveling so fast. I think what, I, faster I, than you normally travel at all? Yeah. Why? I think I clocked 74 miles per hour, just what? myself. What? Yeah. Wow. And the jumps were ridiculous. 74 miles per hour on skis? Yeah, just myself. Yeah, no, you know, car or cage around you. It is just... I, don't, I can't Describe even explain that. it. How is that feeling? You can feel the wind hitting your face and pulling your face. You can feel your body tensing and trying to relax. You know, you're thinking about absolutely everything at the same time, but also thinking about nothing at the same time. Wow. Being able to concentrate on what you're doing and how you're performing, whilst everything that goes on around you you, you just don't see. No. My aim was to get down to the bottom of that slope in one piece as fast as possible. And I don't know if you've seen, but I crashed through the finish line. No, I haven't. So I went through the finish line and I crashed into the barrier. Wow. And I lost a ski and um, 
I actually really badly bruised my coccyx and I couldn't yeah. sit down for the rest of the week. Wow. Uh, so that was a big impact. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I never knew that my time would earn me the silver medal because I was kind of in the wow. middle of a barrier. So I came oh, out. you hit that barrier? Yeah, I was like, it's over. Right. <laughs> I literally grabbed my radio and I was saying to Caroline, I'm okay, I'm okay. But the pain was so strong. And I think just the, the, the emotion that you feel from finishing and not knowing where you are and then crashing. Did you care about your result at that time? Uh, I can't really remember. I think blur. I was just so happy. Yeah, it was literally a blur. I was so happy that I'd got down. And I think I knew I skied really well. But everyone pulls, you know, out their A game at mm. Paralympics, and some people cope well, with it, and some so, people yeah, don't. That's true. And actually, I wasn't in the right place for the kind of podium when I found out I got a silver. And I think I just cried, and I thought it's You're really hard because everyone <laughs> expects you to ha feel a certain way when you win a medal, when you win a competition. You know, not just in sport, but. I didn't really feel it. Okay. And I knew I had to race the next day. That's quite honest as well, though, I think. Yeah. Because I think it's funny that sometimes people expect you to feel some type of way. It doesn't even have to be something on that scale. And that almost makes you feel the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Actually, like, why I am I really not feeling what I'm meant to be yeah. feeling? But do you think that was because you had another race the next day? Do you think it's because ultimately this was just something you did obviously at such a high level but it was also fun you didn't have those expectations and you were just willing to go out and just do the best you could i think some of that i agree with um but also um being able to separate yourself from being in that bubble and performing mm. to thinking about the medal that you've just won I couldn't do that because I no. think I knew I had to race the next day well the day after actually um and knowing that I just won a silver medal and no one else had won a medal on the team that's true I was just like and it, I think it broke history no one had ever won a silver medal at, a medal you know for Paralympics on the snow and I didn't really know what that meant for me no. at that time. But what, did it ever hit you? Yeah, I think it hit me. Like when you say went back to the hotel after? No, no, way after that. I'd say perhaps about a year or so after. What? And I was like, I did that <laughs> kind wow. of moment. And then um, going in, actually thinking about the games because don't you know it's, it's it's quite difficult to think about luckily i did well and i medaled in every race that i competed in but the second day at the games was actually my birthday the 9th of march and i was in the um crowd and i watched the the men's racing mm. and i think that for me was one of the good days because i actually really got to see what it meant to other people yeah. and what the sport can do for other people wow. in all sorts of disabilities, not just of having a visual impairment, but also what the sport does for your, you know, your well-being and your mental health. And then coming back the next day to do the Super G, which is just like the downhill, but slightly shorter. Um, I came down and I was more scared to do the Super G than the downhill wow. the day before. Yeah. Why was that? I think because you know what you're doing. I knew how fast I was going and I was thinking about how scary it is actually to go down at 74 miles an hour. But surely not you train for that. Yes, although I'd only done a downhill. Um, I only did my first downhill race in February and this was in March. Oh, okay, so I can, yeah. And um, I competed in the Super G, and actually, if you watch, coming off the, the lip of the jump, I hit a gate on my left-hand side, and I had a flashback to where I've hit a gate before, 
I knew exactly what I needed to do because what happened in training was I hit a gate and my pole released. Mm. So I had poles which had a band around your wrist. And I remember in training standing up, which you would never do in a speed race, grabbing my pole, putting it back in my hand and getting back in a tuck position. And that whole moment went through my head in during the race of the Super G, where I'd hit the gate. I had a slightly different pole where the pole was connected to my glove. But what happened was, because it was connected to my glove and the pole had hit the the gate, it had swung round and got caught underneath my right arm. And I remember thinking, this is okay. After the moment, I thought, I'm probably going to crash. And I pulled out my arm, managed to get my pole back in the right place. And you've got to think, when we're training, any movement from bringing your arm out slightly, that could be a second. Yeah. You, you know, you train to move every part of your body in a specific way to be the fastest you could be. Wow. So to be having your hand and your arm yeah. on the other side of your body, your posture was totally wrong. I thought, I've screwed wow. this up. So to be able to get back in that position and still be alive, you know, I just pushed for <laughs> it. Not just it. in the race, but alive. No, literally because it came off the jump and I thought I've, I've hit yeah. a gate, I thought I was going straight into that forest and just yeah. collapsing. I've had so many bad crashes where you don't even know you're yeah. flying through the air. So to be able to wow. still be in the race and realise and then get to the bottom, for me, that meant more than the silver medal the day before. Did you have that pressure that you just won a silver medal as well? No, so. I don't really believe in pressure. Okay, explain why. You can't see it, can you? Mm. Interesting. Yeah, that's how I think. I want a good comeback, but I just don't have <laughs> You're one. You're speechless now. Okay. That's how I think. Um, pressure, you can't see it, can you? It's, no. It's not there. So how do you block it out? Because block so what a lot out? of people can say it's a feeling. Well, a feeling would be your nerves. A feeling would be your expectation. And as I said before, honey, if you've got that expectation, you must have done something to give people that expectation. You are good enough to give people that expectation. Is it's that a, a positive. bad thing or is that a good thing? No, it's a good thing. If people don't expect you to do well, you're not doing the right thing. Wow. And and that goes for teaching as well. Everything. Yeah. If students think the parent, uh, sorry, the teachers might not expect me to do well, that's probably mm. potentially because you're not doing the right. You're not doing the right thing. Yeah. That's amazing. Um. So then, what what medal did you win on that race? I won a bronze. Bronze. And that's probably the proudest medal. Because I messed up, but I adapted. I used my training. I got back into the headspace, the racing game, the racing line, and I finished without panicking. Wow. And that, for me, at the end, to be able to win the bronze and still win a medal. That was, I'm very proud of that. And that was where I thought I've actually represented who I am. I know I can ski well, but not everybody knows that you can adapt like that. And Caroline racing in front of me, she didn't even realize I'd hit a gate. Wow. Until, Until, so afterwards you go back and do video analysis. And I said, you can watch this once. We're not watching it again. I mean, there's no point. We're not doing another speed race. Yeah. But I just want you to see as a positive to bring into next the next race. If it's, if something happens, I'm not going to let it stop me. Wow. So you you really did. Yeah. So then, how how many medals you got all together? You got them all there. Yeah. So I won four medals. Four medals. So I won three silvers and a bronze. Mm. So wow. um, this is a silver. It says on each one what they're for. Um, they're very, very heavy. I can imagine. Do you want to have a look? Heavy. Yeah. Have a look. Wow. 
So you got a bronze in that one race. In the Super G, yeah. But I was the, the proudest. Yeah. So you got three silvers and one bronze, but the yeah. bronze is the one you're most proud of because mm-hmm. you literally, you was hit out of your rhythm, but you managed to adapt and you managed to get your level of, just get just bounce back, yeah. basically. Yeah, be so determined that the, wow. the race is not over. It's so incredible. This is the bronze. So the bronze is a little bit lighter because it's plated. And the gold is plated as well. So the silver is pure silver. You can't get the wow. silver in the UK. It's very hard to find. So that's amazing. That's slightly heavier. So imagine wearing all four. Wow. No one. So then talk to me. You've won these four medals. Mm-hmm. Uh, did it really hit you at the time, or how was it coming back to the UK? Oh, um, I think because I'd made history of Britain's most successful Winter Paralympians. Tell them again. That was, that you know. incredible. Yeah, that, that meant that something still, to me. That... No, so um, Mena and Jen, they also won four medals okay. in the Paralympics this year. Yeah. Um, so they've taken the title. But still to have that. Of course. Is amazing. So I was actually meant to race in five disciplines. I was meant to have a race in five races. And the last race I had to um, pull out of, I did the inspection, but I was in so much pain, I couldn't actually no. race. Um, so imagine wow. if I'd raced. <laughs> so when you come back to the UK, what was the response like? Was it surreal? Was it just everything uh, still went on? How did you feel? Well, life just goes on as anyway, normal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was very different for me because what are you getting up for kind of thing you know um i hear that story a lot about olympians and different people they said as soon as they achieve what they set out for it's like what's next what's next yeah obviously i didn't win the gold and i think how was that did because while you kind of went in with no expectations exactly so now do you look back and think why have i trained a bit harder would i have got the gold or do you not think like that or do you wish you stayed Do you know what i did for the last four years I kind of thought like that. I had a I had a niggle in the back of my head. Should I have believed in myself more? And the answer was yes, because I did it. I medalled in every race. Um, I was 0. 0.6 seconds off a gold twice. How much? 0. 0.6 seconds twice. Wow. Um, to the Russian, um, Franz Haver, and that used to annoy me you know should I have believed in myself should I perhaps change something however I think I got that closure once the next games the next Paralympic games had been so um, last year in March Mm. since then it doesn't you know it doesn't affect me as much because what would it have meant if I'd got a gold you know I broke history I represented my country I fulfilled my dream of being able to perform and the gold wouldn't have really given me anything extra no. I could have competed in the next games but trained for the last four years and injured myself and never be able to race again and are you really going to define your success of say 0.6 seconds you know exactly. after everything you've overcome everything you've experienced even your family your dad doing what your dad did growing up and seeing what your mum could do um having say having no sight and just overcoming all of that are you really going to let 0.6 seconds define you and when you think about it what you've already done is absolutely incredible but then you've had all this success why didn't you train for another four years why did you retire um I think a lot of athletes struggle once they retire and I was very lucky in the aspect that I had something else in my life, you know. You've always wanted to do, essentially. Yeah, I've always wanted to teach. I trained whilst skiing. I was more of a rounded person than perhaps an athlete is normally. It's sport, it's their sport from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed. And maybe if I hadn't have focused 
some of my energy in my education or training to be a teacher I might have done better but for me I value my education and the other aspects I have as being a not just an athlete but as a person I didn't want to talk about skiing all the time I don't want to just be represented as that one athlete doing one sport I'm more than that and I value teaching it's to go from something that you're doing and it's solely down to you and being selfish to helping so many different Mm. so many young people in a subject of geography that I absolutely love, it I I value that so much more than being an athlete. So where did your emphasis and love for education and the importance of that really come from? Um, I think being at school myself, there was a lot of inspiring teachers and just travelling and, and loving the human and physical side of geography you know geography is everywhere I say to the students you don't have to just go on holiday to experience geography and I think it's so relevant in in today's society that being a human and a global citizen and seeing your impact on on countries and and different social groups having geography you know, enable me to have a release from just being an athlete mm. and learn and uh, read about something else. You know, my friends and my family don't don't just want to hear about skiing. And th- there's so much more to learn. You know, you're learning all the time. It's really important to broaden your horizons and make sure you can learn as much as about something that you're passionate about. Yeah. So does... Obviously, we talk about everyday life and obviously some frustrations and some things you really have to overcome. Would you say skiing and being a teacher, would you say that is or can be an escape of the everyday struggles you have to go through or you're so used Mm. to now? No, because I can't really escape it. Having a visual impairment isn't a disability where you I don't know perhaps you can escape from from the moment you wake up Mm. it's there affecting you you know everything you do you're you're seeing so I can't really ever ever escape it even when I go to sleep you know I, I dream in a different way I Wow. I used to have the fear of like going to sleep because when I woke up, my what? eyesight was slightly different, you know, and I have that now. Every morning, my right eye is cloudy and it drains away in the day. So it's a lot worse in the morning. And it's something that I have to deal with every day. It's relentless. I don't have a break. However, you know, we're sat down here talking. Um, it's not too different. No. So I think sometimes having a a disability which you can't see is a lot more difficult. Obviously, if you're in a wheelchair, it's quite visual, Mm. but you've still got the ability to move around. It's just in a different way. I will never have the ability to drive, for example. Mm. I think it's it's incredible. And just anybody who's watching this or listening to it, I just think your story is incredible. And just even... what I really like is that you did a huge amount of this whilst getting a university degree and having a big vision of coming and becoming a teacher and making a difference and inspiring as many people as you can not just because of skiing just because you actually have the love for geography you have love for education and that that is going to be that is going to show in what you do in your work, especially moving forward, because it's not like, okay, skiing's done, what should I do next? Yeah, no, it's like, definitely. actually, skiing was fun, yeah. but my passion... Exactly. And it's not... I don't think it's... Um, I don't. You know, I don't set out to be inspirational. It's just my story. You're just doing what you do. Yeah, and there's so many young people who have so many different types of struggles. Mm. And obviously, being in a, in a flat area... Um, you know hardly any percent of the population have the chance to be able to go and ski and even experience that type of landscape Mm. and the tremendous views and doing all sorts of different activities and to be able to be in an inner city school and kind of share those experiences with the students that there's more than just 
Peterborough <laughs> or wherever. Of course. Yeah, it's that has so much more value than kind of teach it. Uh, you know, perhaps coaching um, skiers mm. because. I'm more than just the skiing and I think it's important to show young people whether you're visually impaired or dyslexic or you know you might not just like a subject you can still pass the exams you just might have to go about it in a different way might take you longer to get a degree but you can still do it yeah and that's that and that's absolutely fine we're all here to be different so what does I don't want to keep you for too long, but what does success look like to you now, Jade? Did it look like this before? I know you said, well, I guess not to you, as you said already, you went with no ex, like, you yeah. doing it. So, like, what does, what is success to you now? What does it look like? Because I feel like, obviously, success as a whole is very subjective, so it's different for yeah. everybody. Yeah, definitely. But what, what is it to you? What does um, it mean to you? Happiness. Just being content and happy with the way you're behaving, what you're doing, who you spend your time with. Um, You know, teaching is a very demanding job, but I spend my time with 450 students every week. Wow. And even time with my family, you know, my sisters, they didn't ask me to go away and be an athlete. And hopefully they take away the fact that they can still be able to go and do something yeah. it it doesn't have to be because you can't see very well and it's about the choices that you make that's what I think success is is making those choices not just for yourself but for other people and and valuing your your kind of time and, and what you put your effort into so I ask every guest this as a kind of wrap-up question before you do, I think you've missed a question. Go on. Do you still ski? Do you still oh, ski? That's yes. a great question. That's yes. A very good question. <laughs> I've never got to do it. That's a great question. But do you still ski? Um, recreationally, yes. Okay. I'm teaching my husband how to ski. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but um, I is don't that race fun anymore. Or is that frustrating teaching your husband? No, how to ski? I really like it actually. Okay. Cause I can ski backwards while he's skiing forwards. <laughs> I can be better at something. Um, well, because normally I'm so like reliant on him to drive around and yeah. you know guide me and things like that. So it's nice to have something where I can go and I can be free. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't look any different to anyone else. I might have someone ski in front of me, but um, yeah. it's something that I still love to do just recreationally. Uh, with a teaching ever, do, job. But I, do you ever go anywhere and be like, got my medals, <laughs> so I put my medals to the side? No, because, you know, I don't have them on display or anything like that because it's something that I did f- kind of for me. Yeah. And I don't feel I need to, you know, I always say, I'm I'm the person that you meet. It's not always what you've done, but it's how you treat people and things like that. So when I'm out skiing, I'm out there because I enjoy being in the mountains and 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 being able to the fresh air. Yeah, just, yeah. And and it's not just purely down to the movement of yourself on the skis. It's no. everything that's combined. You know, hot chocolate and hot things chocolate, like that. Marshmallows. <laughs> um, so do you have any more questions? Being rude, jumping in my interview. <laughs> Okay, right. So if you could sit down with three famous people, dead or alive, oh my they don't gosh. even have to be famous. What? Well, three people, dead or alive, put everybody on the spot, and people normally oh. say, "You should have told me about this question." No, that's three the point people. of it. Three people, dead or oh alive. Oh my gosh. Um, it's people who inspire you. Maybe someone in education, geography. I don't know. What? Three people. Three people. Three people. I think it would literally just be three random people off the street. Okay. Explain. So strangers and try and find out their story. You sit on trains, you sit on buses, you sit on airplanes and you literally don't know what anyone else has done or is doing or where got they're their going. Own story. Yeah. And everyone's got their own story. So three random people outside, I would choose those three people. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. Cool. So I think this is amazing. I definitely feel we need to do a part two. Okay. <laughs> I think that would be good. Got a lot to talk Obviously, about. Obviously, there's parents evening at the school and stuff as well. But yeah, I think there's there's a, definitely a huge amount we can talk about. But where can people find you? Um, I'm on Twitter. 
So at Racy Jade Ski, that's been my handle for ages. So yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Um, so any any requests or so next questions sure you, that we make, need to yeah, answer yeah, next make, time. Make sure, make sure make sure you do that, guys. Um, I'll also put the link in the bio of this video and also on iTunes when the audio version goes up. Um, but I just want to say honestly, massive thank you for doing this no, today. Thank um, you. Your story, I know you said you don't set out to be inspiring, but there is no doubt you are. Um, not just, it's not, for me, it's not just about the medals, it's what you overcome, and especially what you're doing now as far as for the youth and in the school and being a teacher. I feel like that these, the younger generation are gonna remember you for a very long time. Yeah. Not because of this, but for what you do and saying to even think about coming out of your city or going to explore different places so um once again massive thank you thank you for having me and there you have it guys um another episode of dreams reality podcast this one's absolutely incredible um i didn't realize how heavy <laughs> these, these medals are um but once again make sure you like comment and share uh, we'll definitely do a part two, so if you have any other questions I might have missed, just like what Dave just done, um, then do let me know, because um, we will be making this happen again. But yeah, like, comment, share, hit that big red button and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next episode.